Coming up today on LinkedIn News Live. More than 2 million women have left the labor force since COVID-19, and millions more have been forced to cut back hours. Those numbers get more dire for mothers. We speak with two experts on how we can reverse that. Plus, why only a fraction of American women feel ads portray them accurately. All that next. Hello, I'm Caroline Fairchild, and welcome to LinkedIn News Live, where the business conversation begins with you. It's March 10th, and here's a quick look at the top headlines trending right now on LinkedIn. Chipotle ties exec compensation to diversity. Retailers team up to survive. And American women question female ads. Let's take a deeper dive into that story. Exclusive research for LinkedIn from data intelligence company Morning Consult found that only 29% of U.S.-based women believe that they are represented accurately in advertising, and only 6% describe that portrayal as very accurate. Meanwhile, 44% of men say that women are represented accurately in ads. Joining us now to discuss this is Kelly Schweitzer. She covers marketing for us here at LinkedIn. Kelly, these numbers are, are crazy. Break down a little bit what this, this study found. This study found that despite continued efforts to make progress, there has been very little when it comes to representation and advertising. Now, we're talking about huge, huge issues with women still being portrayed in a stereotypical way as the mom who does it all, as the Stepford wife, as the woman who has it together but no career. This is a huge problem that brands keep perpetuating, and it's something that people don't understand, something that respondents said specifically specifically was, I want to be shown as more than mom. I want to see myself on screen. I want to have someone who looks like me, whose race is mine, whose body shape is mine. And that's something that brands continue to get in their own way. Well, all those archetypes that you just described, Kelly, I, I don't identify with any of them. So I guess I'm in that cohort of women who just don't see myself in advertising today. But look, you you're, you talk to marketers all the time. A lot of great minds are thinking about this, are conscious of this. Why is this still a problem? There are so many cooks in the kitchen when it comes to something like this. And one of the biggest issues is that in the entire media supply chain, we're missing women. What I mean by that is this is not just about who is in front of the camera. This is about who's behind the camera, who's placing the ads, who's being represented at every single stage of the process. This is where the whole thing falls apart. And something that's been really interesting is that in light of Women's History Month, in light of Black History Month, people are saying to brands, it is not about what you say. It is what you do. And, and how do brands do that effectively? You talk about marketers and what the expectations are from consumers in terms of big moments like, say, International Women's Day, Women's History Month, Black History Month. What, when, when you say that it's about what they do, what does that mean from a marketer's perspective? It's about consistency. So something that people say over and over again, especially this year after the civil unrest we saw last year, is I'm done with you treating Black History Month as a one-off. I wanna see your commitment to the Black community 12 months a year, 365 days a year. And that's something where people are watching and calling brands out for their commitment or lack thereof. So they may say, we're donated $500,000 to this black community fund. And then their board and their leadership is entirely white. That's inconsistent. And people are calling that out. They are belief driven buyers. They want to buy from brands that believe in what they do. And this really hits on something that you've been covering for us here at LinkedIn, Callie, which is just the, the evolving role of the marketer and how much the marketer is stepping into other leadership positions within companies. How do you see that changing in 2021? What are you hearing on the ground? The marketer is really the brand steward. This is somebody who is responsible for not only the external brand, but the internal brand. And we've seen over the last year that the line between the two has completely dissolved. What used to be, hey, this is how we look for the customer, and oh, this is what our internal culture is like, 
those things cannot be different anymore because your employees are your greatest ambassador or your biggest critics. And that's something that with the rise of social media can be shared in an instant. A brand can go viral in an instant. And that's something where that consistency matters to employees and to consumers. Speaking of that virality, Callie, I've just been seeing a ton of conversation in my social feed about what happened with Burger King UK. For those in the stream who are joining us and don't know, break down what happened. Burger King UK, in honor of International Women's Day, was attempting to announce a scholarship program for Burger King employees who want female employees who want to study culinary skills and and school. This was something that completely fell apart because Burger King did something I mentioned earlier. It got in its own way. It decided to be provocative and use one tweet in which it said, women belong in the kitchen. Now, this is obviously a centuries old stereotype that is now being perpetuated because of the nature of something like Twitter that can't sit out of context. That can't be something that is reinforced. And so what was interesting is that the brand at first defended it and people were shocked. They said, you know, you should delete this tweet. And they said, why would we delete it? This is about furthering women in their careers. Women belong in the kitchen if they want to be in the kitchen. And it was a disaster. People were piling on. But then something that we saw was that women and men who were criticizing the brand were then all of a sudden being harassed and abused in the Twitter responses. And that's something that finally made the brand say, okay, this has gone haywire. They deleted the tweets and they apologized for what could have been a really well intended, a really well executed program into something right. that went completely into the back burner. <laughs> no pun intended, get it, Burger King. Uh, and I saw some tweets that said they should have just changed the name to Burger Queen. It was right in front of them the whole time, which was of course a joke. But Callie, from your perspective, what's the number one lesson that marketers should take away from this disaster that you just portrayed? It's important to take risks, but it is never worth completely devastating your brand with one tweet, one saying, one campaign, something like that, it is so obvious that that would not work today, tomorrow, or 20 years from now. That is something that is completely reductive and it allows women to continue to be put off in a quarter. It's something that in an effort to reach gender equality, in an effort to diversify what every company looks like, it was a complete disaster. Well, Callie, thank you so much for joining us on LinkedIn News Live. And if you want more insights from Callie, she has a ton of them in her newsletter, Marketer Must Read. Go to her profile and check that out. We'll see you next time, Callie. Thanks. Right, that was Callie Schweitzer. And for more stories like these, be sure to check out the news module to the right of your LinkedIn feed. Or if you're in mobile, you can click into that search box. We've been polling professionals on the LinkedIn news page, and now we want to hear from you too in the stream with the poll that we have for you today. What's the most impactful way and we can empower, employers can empower and support working mothers or caregivers? Is it A, a more flexible work schedule, B, fewer meetings or video calls, C, more family care benefits, or D, other? Let us know your vote in the stream right now, but more importantly, let us know your thoughts behind your vote and we'll have a conversation with our guests about today's poll. All right, do we need a Marshall Plan for working moms? As the coronavirus pandemic continues to have an outsized impact on working women, an estimated 5.4 million women have lost their jobs, nearly a million more than men. Now the number of women in the workforce is at a 33 year low. A resolution for a Marshall Plan for Moms that seeks to restore mothers in the workforce was introduced in the US House of Representatives and the Senate. Joining us now to discuss is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code, an advocate for Marshall Plan for Moms, Rashma Sanjani, as well as the founder and CEO of New Power Media and owner of Women's Network, The List, and Choquette. Rashma, Anne, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, how are you? Great to be here. 
Rashma, I, I want to start with you. This plan that you've, you've you've been such a big advocate for and have supported and proposed, it, it's going to pay women for the unpaid labor that they are doing in the house right now, as well as support those who do want to re-enter the workforce. But I want to get to the personal story behind why you started to be such an advocate for this. Tell us a little bit about why you why you pivoted such a large part of your career towards this cause. Yeah. So I started COVID-19 with a newborn baby. Uh, it was January 25th. It was the first time that I was going to take maternity leave. You know, I had my son via surrogate, so I was definitely looking forward to spending those months with him when he was born because I didn't get to carry him. And then COVID-19 happened, and I was running, found myself having to cancel my maternity leave and save my nonprofit which was you know, for women and girls, because when global pandemics happened, the first organizations to be hit are women and girls. So I saw, found myself with a newborn baby, having being a CEO of uh, you know, a, a nonprofit that was under risk and having to homeschool a five-year-old. And every night I was just barely making it. Uh, you know, I got the acne on my face that I haven't had since I was 16. I got COVID, but it barely registered because I was working 20 hours a week. And I think like mo many of us in the beginning, we were grinning and bearing it. And as I would look on my Zoom screen and I would see other women who looked exactly how I looked, beaten, worn down, just done. And in September, when the schools didn't open, I think we went from grinning and bearing it to feeling like out of control, you know, barely hanging on. And I think that thing that many of us thought or realized was, I, there's no other word to call it but fear that a bunch of male legislators can make decisions about us. You know, when they closed the school and came up with blended learning, it was this 1950s sensibility, well, that someone was gonna be at home and log our kids on at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and they didn't even ask us. They didn't even see us. And so I wrote this op-ed um, because at the same time, the numbers that we were seeing of the economic crisis, I mean, Women, our labor market participation is now where it was in 1989, that we could lose 30 years of progress in just nine months. All the work that I've been doing for the past decade at Girls Who Code was gone and at risk. Right. We had lost that gender parity. And so that's what inspired me um, to take out a full page ad in the New York Times and said, enough. We are not America's social safety net. Mm -hmm. And it just, look, I think that when you, when you speak the truth, and I think I spoke something that so many women were just too exhausted to say, I think that women across the globe just felt seen. And there's all these fights that are coming up all across the country of women saying enough, enough. Well, speaking of marketing, I want to know what marketer came up with the term blended learning to describe the disaster that is what a lot of working mothers and working parents find themselves doing right now. And I think we'll have to save that for another conversation. And Rashma was just very honest with us about how she's been feeling as a parent during this pandemic. And I know it's something that you've been tracking through your work. You just did a cover story for parents on this very topic. What are you hearing on the ground? Why hasn't this been resolved yet at this point in the pandemic? Um, thank you. And thank you, Reshma, for sharing such a personal story. Um, it's hard now, a year later, even to think back to where we were when like, the world felt like it was um, crumbling around our ears. And I wrote the cover story for Parents Magazine, and it's funny, the story was in the works for a long time. And we kept thinking, well, it's going to be about how to recession proof your family, or it's going to be about all the crisis that we're having. When we finally realized that this needed to focus on how do we build back better? What can we do in this moment of crisis to be seen, to be heard, to make policies that work for us? Because so often, just like Reshma said, as women are like looking at each other, beaten, unseen, unheard, we think it's our fault. We think it's something that we can hack our way out of. We think if we just work harder, lean in more to our job, um, that we can magically make hours in the day and mental health to take care of everyone. This is not a crisis that we can hack our way out of. This is not, this is my message to working mothers. This is not your fault. There is finally, because of the magnitude of this crisis, there is finally political will 
and policies being put in place that are going to make the world, the work world, hopefully more flexible, more equal, and more, more able to bring your whole self to work. I think the ultimate lesson of this pandemic has is for uh, women who work for, particularly who work for big companies, right? That this is not the time to say like, I'm fine, I'm fine, don't worry about me. I got it, I got it, yes, I'll make the deadline happen. This is the time to say, I can't make that happen. I need help. There's no way that, that think we can pretend that things haven't changed. And that could really open the door for us to see significant change for women. And, and Rashma, piggybacking on Anne just said, we recently did a survey of women on LinkedIn and we found that 60% of women actually, they just, they don't feel comfortable saying I need help. They don't feel comfortable going to their manager and saying this isn't working for me. I can't make that meeting. How do we change that? And how can a Marshall Plan, which of course is in, in reference to the post-World War II program, uh, how, how, can we, how can that change that in terms of making sure that private companies are supporting women? Well, one, you know, the plan calls for a 360 plan to get women back to work. And the first thing is, you know, monthly payments to mothers for their unseen, unpaid work. And I know that that's a radical idea, but we have to have that conversation. You know, so many of us were stuck in our homes with partners. They saw that we were doing the laundry. They saw that we were buying all the groceries. They saw that we were doing all the homeschooling all the while we were maintaining our full time jobs and nothing changed. 86% of all homeschooling is still done by mothers, by working mothers. And so we have to ask ourselves, has nothing changed because that work is unseen, unvalued, uncompensated, and have that conversation. We got to pass policies like paid leave and affordable daycare. Uh, there have been incredible advocates, you know, paid leave for US, paid leave for all, you know, National Domestic Workers Alliance. Like part of what we want to do at Marshall Plan for Moms is ignite a populist moms movement to march and rally for paid leave and affordable daycare. I want all the moms at my PTA to be just talking about paid leave and why we don't have it and how we're gonna get it. And so that's an opportunity for us. And finally, you know, we have got to push the private sector. Look, there was a motherhood penalty before this, and there's gonna be even a more severe motherhood penalty after this. I just don't believe that now that you've seen my life on my Zoom screen, You've seen my five-year-old ask me for my chocolate chip muffin. You've heard my baby crying in the back. You've heard my husband ask me if I bought the bananas. That you're now going to look at me and say, gosh, i got to hire a mom. <laughs> you're not. You absolutely. are absolutely not. And so unless we organize, to what Ann said, unless we organize on workplaces and literally have a checklist, flexibility, remote working, child care, you know, companies have been really good. I was talking to the economist Betsy Stevenson last night, who's just brilliant. She's been working on this forever. And she said, you know, Rashma, companies have had so many, you know, off ramps for, for moms. Where are the on ramps? And I think that that's what the return ships, you know, we want millions of them. And what else are we not thinking of? I mean, I think the opportunity here is I saw on your poll, you're like A, B, C, or D. I'm like E, all of the above, and then F. I'm like 10 other ideas that I have that we haven't seen yet. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and bring back the poll that we have for the members in the stream so they can get their votes in. And if, hey, you want to vote E and F, as Rush was saying, let's take those votes too. We'll tally them up. But what's the most impactful way an employer can show support for working mothers or caregivers? Is it A, a more flexible work schedule, B, fewer meetings or video calls, C, more family care benefits, or D, other? Let us know your vote, but more importantly, your thoughts behind your vote. And what Rush is really talking about right now is just how much the rhetoric around what working women, what working mothers need to do has, has really changed. I think back to the Sheryl Sandberg lean in days, as, as you just referenced, where it was about how can women do more in order to make the workplace work for them through your, your reporting, through your conversation with women on the list. Is that is that changing marketedly and how can we get it to change faster? The conversation has to change, but has to be open to many different kinds of solutions. What Reshma is proposing, the Marshall Plan for Moms, yes. Do we need technology that's going to come into companies? I'm very obsessed these days with fam tech, right? Companies that are going to provide solutions for working families. Check, yes. Do we need paid leave? Yes. Do we need more research? Do we need more employee resource groups? Do we need 
more opportunities for women to step into positions of power. Yes, check, check, check. We need them all. This is not a time to um, narrow the focus or to say that we want to put everything into neat little boxes. This is the time to explore every single possibility. Because one of the things that we have seen in this pandemic is how important working women are for everyone, for families, for equalities, for business. The There's... Um, as Rashma was talking, I was imagining this sort of superhero women who were all coming in to swooping in to save us. And it's true. There are women who have risen into positions of power who are now in a role to either light the way for other women in their company, to make the policies that we need, to be the thought leaders that we need. And um, that really is sort of the culmination of the change that is going to that is going to lead us up to this moment and is going to keep us from tipping into that really dangerous place of are we going to set ourselves back a decade are we going to set ourselves back 30 years the the goal is not to be where we were at the beginning of 2020 right the goal is not for women to end up in the same place working double frankly double shifts right the goal is for us to be in a better place, to be more equitable, to be more seen. Well, and what you just said reminded me of a headline that I saw recently, which is something along the lines of working mothers are the ones who come in to save the day, but what happens when working mothers are the ones who need to be saved? Uh, Rashma and Anna, I'm gonna say hello to some members who are joining us in the stream. We have Diana from Colorado, Alberto from Atlanta, Monica from Arizona, and Camille from New York City. Thanks for joining us on LinkedIn News Live. And a comment here from Ann Schur who says, Working mothers have always worked a double shift. And as Anne just said, now with pandemic that supports that makes this possible, like school and childcare have been taken away. The challenges are intensified. So if you're joining us in this conversation, we appreciate you joining us. Rashma, we've been talking a lot about what the private sector can do, which, which is also was, was obviously very near and dear to the hearts of us here at LinkedIn. But I want to talk a little bit about what you're seeing on Capitol Hill right now, these movements getting pushed forward with policy changes. What, what are you seeing? We've never had an extensive care, care infrastructure in this country. Is there hope that that will change? I mean, I absolutely do. I mean, I am heartened by Biden's, you know, relief bill, you know, especially in particular, the emphasis that we're having on, on child care that we're, you know, again, bailing out the child care industry, which we need to because so many daycares had to shut down and then providing, you know, parents with, you know, a child care tax credit. Um, I think that that's really important. I mean, for the very first time, this is why I would say like it's a down payment on the Marshall Plan that, you know, every family in July is going to get $3,000, you know, to help pay for childcare. That's huge. And that's never happened before because it's an acknowledgement that the United States is one of the few countries that don't provide this. I mean, last week, Chairman Jerome Powell, you know, at the Federal Reserve said, I think we need, I think we need to have, like, you know, a national childcare policy. And we all fell out of our chair because it was the first time that we made the connection between the economy and childcare. It's an infrastructure issue, you know? And so I think having the emphasis on this is really important. Uh, we need to keep fighting for paid leave that did not make it through this bill. And if you think about it, if in March, if every you know worker had paid leave, you know, we wouldn't have had probably as much you know, many deaths from COVID in those months because people would have gotten sick and felt like they could actually stay home. Wait, say more about that, Rashma, because that's an interesting thought. We could, we could have had more less COVID deaths if there was just more infrastructure from the care side in our economy. Absolutely. I mean, so many people in March, right, said, oh, I'm not feeling too well today. And they went to work. And then that's how it spread. Right. And it's because we don't offer paid sick days and paid sick leave. And so I really think that seeing, you know, that if anything was a wake up call to us that like paid leave should be offered. And part of the issue is that many paid leave is being offered by the Googles and the Microsoft and the LinkedIn of the world. But, you know, everyday workers in retail and food and restaurants aren't getting it and they need it more than us. And so, again, it's creating inequity. And same thing with the child care. Listen, I do think that the private sector can lead the way in subsidizing child care. Uh, and part of how we need to talk about it is it's not just a benefit for your employees, but it's an investment into the children of our country. We know that at the earliest of ages, if you have child care and you're getting early education, that you're going to be healthier, that you're going to you know, make more money in your lifetime, that it's just good for our country.
And that's why so many other nations, like in Norway, when you have a baby, they drop off diapers and milk every day. I mean, think about that, right? So we are so, it's, it's so funny as I've been, every day I, t- I talk to so many people who are leading mothers movements across the world and learn from them. And they feel the sorriest for us, for American mothers, that they actually think that globally we are treated the worst, that, that we have the worst benefits, we have the worst amount of respect. I mean, part of what I'm running through Washington right now and saying, just say the word, just say mothers, right? Say the word. Well, Rashma, I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm also kind of crying in the inside right now. I was on CBS this morning last week and I did a, a hit remotely and I, it was about working mothers and working women. And after the hit stopped, there was a woman who was in the room with me who was a producer and she said, I'm from Iceland. I just don't understand how this country treats women. She was just, she's just appalled by everything that we were discussing. Um, and I'll bring you into the discussion. I, I think about you. I think about you writing this story for, for Parents Magazine and it evolving as the pandemic was evolving. I think a lot of women expected, needed this to be resolved by this point in the pandemic. We're we're a year into this thing and we're seeing from survey data, we're seeing from labor market data that nothing has really been resolved. We're still seeing just terrible numbers coming out of the workforce of of working women. What's holding companies back? What are you hearing in your reporting? You know, change is slow and it's scary and it's hard and you have to want you have to want change and you have to listen to the change makers. And um, unfortunately it's not turnkey, right? This is, this is complicated stuff. I read that LinkedIn report about um, taking the pulse of women saying they felt so unsupported and they felt afraid. And it really is, um, it's heartbreaking to think that a year of our lives falling apart and for us trying to put them back together on so many levels, so many things that we have lost this year, that the loss of confidence in your ability, in your job, is a really damaging place for women to be. And I think that we can't, um, we can't overlook that, right? That mental wellness piece of this that's a real crisis looming, that that not only do we have to take care of the policies, but we have to take care of the women. And and I look at this amazing panel that I have in front of me right now, and you both are doing so much work to support working women, but in your your background and your hearts, Rushmo with Girls Who Code, and Anne, you've been a longtime champion for women and girls and the former editor-in-chief of Seventeen. I'm curious how you're thinking about what the next generation, what we're hoping to build for them, how you hope things should change. Reshma, I'll start with you. Look, I think that this generation in many ways is, 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 wants to lean out in a positive way, right? They want to basically build this back differently. In many ways, feminism and capitalism, you know, we've gotten here because we needed to ask for more and we needed to have different structures. And so again, I'm hopeful that like we're tearing it back down and we're gonna build it back up. Like every day, I think we need to tap into our anger, tap into our fear, ignite that populist mom's rage and to say no more. You know, I'm proud that in Congress, you know, Congresswoman Mang and you know, Senators Klobuchar and Senators Duckworth, the women introduced a Marshall Plan for moms and that they see us. And, you know, I think, Anne, these companies, if they're not already, should be terrified of the moms that are coming for them, right? And, and so this is a new day. And I, 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 one of the things that it's just, we're not talking about enough is that as, as we close down schools, you have so many kids that are not logging on, that are not learning, and it's girls. In order for their mothers to go to work, they have had to lean out of school to take care of their siblings. And so who's measuring that? Who's doing something about that? So like, I refuse again to go back. You know, Anne and I have been in the trenches for way too long to get to this point of 2020. And I'm with you, all right? I don't even want 2020 anymore. Like I wanna fast forward to what 2016 was gonna look like. Like I'm that mad, right? And that fired up about this. But we're not going back, we're just not. But that means we're gonna have to fight. And, you know, we're going to have to potentially fight against friends, you know, sure. and people who we who are, you know, technically have been on our side, but that who aren't going to do who need to do more. 
I and thank goodness, not throughout that. <laughs> I thank goodness for Reshma's anger and for her um, her passion in this moment. I have a little more optimism in this next generation. I am the ultimate champion of millennial women, that they are game-changing rock star pioneers who are redefining what it means to be successful. And so much of the changes that they have been demanding of work, transparency, well, we can all see into each other's lives right now, flexibility, well, ultimately we are being flexible working early in the morning, late at night, in from our from our computers wherever they go, um, and also community, right? This idea that we are not on our own, that we are here to help each other. That this that the that the competition, the moment of competition between women, whenever that existed, is long gone. That we need to lock arms. I'm going to lock arms with Reshma and channel her rage and her anger and her passion to get changes made. And those are changes that millennial women have been champions of. So I actually think, yes, we're in the thick of the pain, but I think we're going to come out on the other side with a brighter future. I certainly hope so. Rashma, and I appreciate your anger. I appreciate your optimism. I appreciate your enthusiasm and all the work that you're doing to further this cause. We'll be tracking it through the next year. And I just, I can't wait to connect with you both again. Thanks for joining us on LinkedIn News Live. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, that was Mrs. Rush Mishanjani of Girls Who Code, as well as Anne Shokat of New Power Media. I want to thank them for joining us on LinkedIn News Live. We have the poll results for you now in the stream on what employers can do to best support working women. A whopping 76% of you said a more flexible workplace schedule. 15% say more family care benefits would be great. And to Reshma's point about we just need it all, Mary, Mary says and other, it has to be a combination of those that are listed, especially for single mothers. I want to thank you all for joining us and for letting us know your vote in the poll. Tomorrow on LinkedIn News Live, we're continuing the conversation around Women's History Month with it, with Tina Chen of the Time's Up movement. Three years since the launch of Time's Up, we sit down with her to talk a path forward for working women during this challenging time. I'm Caroline Fairchild. Thanks so much for joining us on LinkedIn News Live.